Historical accounts from early Spanish explorers who came to California looking for gold indicate that often they saw many columns of smoke rising from distant mountains. Little did these explorers know that what they were witnessing was a time-tested demonstration of controlled burning, a technique practiced by Native American Indians to prevent wildfires in the area's forest lands. Today, we know this early fire ecology philosophy helped shape California's ecological history. But in the years that followed the Spanish explorers, control burning by new migrations of settlers colonizing the West was largely ignored until a modern-day pioneer in fire ecology training came along. That man was Harold Biswell. His teaching and training activities in fire ecology, particularly in Southern California's San Diego County during the 1970s and 80s, continues to influence today's ecologists working to restore fire to the forest, chaparral, and grasslands in this region. His ability to transcend the barrier between scientist and classroom and the hands-on concept of training and applying prescribed fire techniques is considered by many observers to be a unique approach to forest land preservation. Harold brought his wisdom and experience to Southern California during the early 1970s when fire suppression philosophy and policy had become deeply entrenched in government and public agencies responsible for wildlands fire control. Agency leaders were convinced that prescribed fire was of no value in chaparral and forest vegetation management. They believed it would affect too many people and increase the threat of liability. In fact, during this period, the idea of prescribed fire technology and training was practically non-existent. But Harold Bilswell, on the other hand, firmly believed in the importance of fire and its role in nature's plan. He based his beliefs on extensive research that examined not only the thousands of years of natural fires that occurred in California, but also how Native Americans used fire in shaping the state's landscape. The message was long overdue when Doc Biswell began his educational and training programs in San Diego County nearly 20 years ago. His persistence and tireless efforts at promoting the restoration of fire to its evolutionary role in this region eventually influenced and encouraged state government leaders and others to lay aside the myth of fire exclusion in Southern California. We believe the following field day and workshop at the William Heiss County Park in San Diego County in May of 1983 illustrates Harold Biswell's teaching and training methodology in fire ecology and the importance of restoring controlled fire to our wildlands. Truly, California's history was born of fire. The objective here in the park is to get fire back into the ecosystem. Fire is something that's natural. Fire has always been here. It's always going to be here. It's something that's natural. And so with fire protection over the years, they decided that, well, we're not working in harmony with nature. Uh, fire is something that's natural. The parks are managed more or less as natural areas. And so if we're going to manage them as natural areas, we've got to get fire back into the ecosystem. And so this is the overall objective. So why get fire back in the ecosystem? The main reason is because without fire, fire hazards build up, and we get these tremendous fires that we don't want. The oak population here. Uh, the oak in this area are not a shade tolerant species, so these insect cedars grow up over the tops of the oaks, shade them out, and they die off. So by burning, burning the fires through this area, and reducing the incense cedar, it gives the oaks a chance to get back into the way they should be. Um, the trees have been let burn so long, or have gone without burning so long in this area that the cedars have grown up to a point where we haven't been able to burn all of them, so there has been some, some mechanical removal going on in this area. But uh, as you can see, it's, it's quite a bit different from this side. We have opened it up quite a bit by just running one fire through. But we like to put these first fires through under these uh, moist conditions. 
And I think down through this type, the Indians did a lot of burning. Indians did a lot of burning. There were lightning fires. A lot of the fires burnt under Santa Ana conditions. But the Indians did a lot of burning too. Okay, you might say, why did the Indians burn? I think maybe the main reason they burned was for self-protection. If you were back up in this country, when there are no roads, no way to get out except by foot, and if a Santa Ana came through, what would you do? You'd stand there and burn up. Indians didn't want to do that. So they got out in the springtime, and they burned these, uh, they burned the fields, they kept the fire hazards down. They always had places to go in case of a fire. So they did a lot of burning down through here just for self-protection. Uh, they've observed over probably several times that a fire in the summertime can be pretty intense. And so they burned in the springtime, did a lot of burning in the springtime, so the summer fires would not be so intense. So through here, yeah, springtime fires, except for the Indians, summer fires, except for lightning. The fires were very frequent. Beautiful state parks have a beautiful program going. The best, the best there is, by far. That includes the Forest Service, CDF, and all the rest of it. Started about three years ago, uh, started recognizing the problem of heavy fuels and the fact that fire is a part of the, the ecosystem. So we hired Dr. Biswell to put together the program. And it's one of those programs that kind of sunsets itself because uh, Doc's goal was to train sort of a central cadre of, of burners who would become trained and then they would uh, branch out, hire other, or not hire other people, but train other people in the techniques and the ecology of prescribed burning. So we're just about to reach that point where we graduated, I think this spring will be close to 10 people, graduated uh, prescribed burn trainees throughout the state, and those people, such as Larry Long here, who will be graduating probably next week, will then manage the program and the training in their region, there's four regions of the state that the Parks has uh, segmented it into. So unfortunately, Doc is probably not going to be part of the field training after this spring. Now, the next cycle of trainees will go through the program starting in the fall, and we'll have some classroom training at our training academy at the CMR next January. And I'm sure Doc is going to be very active in putting that together. But we'd like to thank him for his participation and, and efforts to get this program off the ground. It's, it's pretty involved, and it's probably the most extensive of any agency's uh, training right now. We require 60 days of field training actual techniques from our trainees before we graduate them, as well as 12, 12 days of uh, classroom ecology on uh, everything, every aspect of prescribed burning you can, uh, you can imagine. So I think it's pretty extensive. We also require that out of those 60 days in the field that be about 10 days, uh, preferably in each type of vegetation, and that we mean understory burning, such as you see here, chaparral burning or brushland burning, as well as third major type, which would be uh, grassland or meadow burning. So each one of those types of vegetation requires a little bit different technique and a uh, different type of management goal in, your, in, the, in the way you're managing that vegetation. Harold, yeah. when you run two or three annual fires through here, and get the fuel down to where you think it ought to be, then in this type, how frequently would you would you want to reburn? Uh, within the park here, this thousand acres, I would go out with about two men, one more person to do it, and I'd do some burning every year. Spot here, spot over there, spot back over here. Just sort of keep it broken up with the fresh burn. Because when you make a fresh burn, then it uh, makes it quite uh, secure against fire for that year. And so it'd just be sort of rotation, burning here and there. The fields build up very fast. And so I don't think you want to say, oh, I'm going to burn it every seven years or every six years or something of that sort. I do some every year. Might be places where you want to keep the fire off for a few years. Uh, what would you say? Do you have some ideas on it? No? 
I tell you, I'm very leery about fall burning. Uh, my, my, uh, I worry too much about those San Diego's. Yeah, we're doing fall burning. Yeah, we're doing fall burning. But uh, we wait, and we did quite a lot down in Kumaka. We wait until there's enough rainfall to soak this stuff up pretty well. It's pretty well soaked up. This is a part of the prescription for fall burning. And then we want the grasses to start growing. For example, if right down here, if there's a meadow, we want that meadow to begin to green up. We say that the grass must be at least two inches tall. So if we get a good rain and the grass there in the meadows start growing, then we're ready to start burning. Well, I don't know really what I have to say, but you know how time flies when you're having fun. And I've had fun for the last five years or six. And there's nothing more fun than doing this prescribed burning when you once get into it. Because you can see your the results of what you're doing. Like Doc says, if you believe in it, you know what it is, you have a background, we've got an old farmer here smelling the dirt, finding out whether it's sour or sweet. You know those kind of things, those, and you look for those things, then you know whether you're doing the, the soil, the ecology, any good. Well, just through observation, you can tell whether you're doing the, the forest any good. We are doing the forest some good. We're doing the wildlife some good. We're improving the habitat. We have to be improving the wildlife. All of these things work together. And the end result is that we're going to have something better here than when we started. And I don't know what you could ask more out of life is to have a little something better than when you started. Well, thanks, LG. Good talk. Well, uh, but uh, he reminded me of one thing, and that is that this fire is a very interesting subject because fire is related to every aspect of the environment. Can you name one thing that fire is not related to? It's related to the people and their beliefs, what they believe, uh, and their politics. It's related to the atmosphere, a little smoke here and there. It's related to the vegetation. It's related to the wildlife. It's related to the soils. What is it not related to? Fire is related to every aspect of the environment. And there's so many different aspects to it uh, that you never learn all there is to be known about it. And then there are three aspects to fire, of course. One is fire prevention. One is fire suppression and the other is fire use. Now in the past, we've been giving an awful lot of attention to fire prevention, an awful lot of attention to fire suppression, but very little attention to fire use. Uh, maybe I shouldn't be saying it here, making that statement here, because most of you are in range management. Of course, the range managers over the years have been doing a lot of burning. The range manager, range people did a lot of burning, starting way back about 1946. So range people have always been interested in burning. Wildlifers have always been interested in burning because in practically every case, it improves conditions for the wildlife. And so those uh, two groups of people have long been interested in this burning. So one way to demonstrate this is to get down, put your hand under it, Let the fire burn over. Did I get a hold of oh, the hand? Get my face. <laughs> but my hand, I don't feel anything. Hand is cold. Did I get that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what happened? The hand is kept cold. <laughs> no. Oh. Oh, <laughs> 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 <
he just doesn't get down to it. A lot of moisture. And this uh, moisture condition of the soil is very important. Well, a lot of people are concerned about smoke, of course. And there's lots of confusion between this wood smoke and the air pollution. Uh, but air pollution, I mean from automobiles, from the burning of gasoline and oils, and from uh, plants that burn coal, that's a bad type of pollution. Those are the pollutants that give rise to the acid rain. Uh, this doesn't give rise to the acid rain. Any comments on that? <laughs> okay, now yeah, another... You were saying that wood smoke is good smoke. Wood smoke is good smoke. That's a good way to put it. Okay, now another thing uh, people criticize, they're always thinking about the bad things. And they, they, they associate this burning, well, with wildfires and so forth. The other fire is bad. This is what they think about. And so they think of all the bad effects. Now, they don't like this because this black. They don't like this because this black. Gary, I was going to introduce you. Uh, they, don't like, they don't like this black. I like it. Why do I like this black? I like it because it's part of nature. It had to burn to keep the fuels down for their own safety. If there was no burning, the fuel's built up. What the heck would you do if you were out here and the fire came through? you just burn up. But if you had areas where the low fire hazards, well, then you can move in there and be safe. I keep telling you my class, I'm not sure whether they all follow me yet or not, but what would you so far, boundaries? Uh, and so, really, there's no such thing as nature. The nearest we could ever get to nature understanding what it was like was studying the situation as it existed before a man began to tinker with it, white man began to tinker with it. Then we figure out just how it was, what it was, and how it got that way. Okay, fire was an important factor. Then we've got to use fire, and I say work in harmony with nature. Everything you do is in harmony with nature. And if you do this, it's pretty hard to go wrong. It's very hard to go wrong working in harmony with nature. Well, I would uh, like to point out that uh, Doc today has been talking about fuel moisture and uh, wind speed and uh, this sort of thing. And uh, that is what I like to see uh, in uh, contrast to uh, the trend nowadays that uh, nothing is good if it doesn't go through a computer or something of this sort. And uh, we've, in, in the Pacific Southwest Station and other branches of research, so I, uh, we've seen quite a few people who uh, uh, wouldn't do anything with prescribed fire if they couldn't through, run it through a little handheld calculator and come out with some print out, uh, printed out figures. But, uh, the point I would like to make is that uh, these basic factors of uh, amount of fuel and uh, the moisture of the fuel and the wind speed and the humidity uh, are the basics. And if we understand those, why then we can do prescribed burning. We can also uh, use these little uh, innovations like handheld calculators if we want to. But uh, over the years, I have seen uh, more prescribed burns uh, on the forest and elsewhere that I uh, didn't consider very successful than I have, which were real successful burns. And the reason for it was not enough attention paid to the ratio of dead to live fuel and these other factors which Doc has been talking about. Well, I think we could use a few more of you to promote it too. That's what got it started down here. You are what? A few more Dr. Biswell's. Oh. Uh, we knew what the problem was, but we weren't sure really how to handle it, but uh, uh, we appreciate your guidance in helping us getting started down here. And, uh, I, I agree, if we could get more people going and a few more dollars, uh, we could uh, maybe reduce our fire problem down here. Start to keep it under control. Keep it under control, All right. We know we're always going to have fires, but if an area like this burns in the summer, we're not going to lose the trees, and that's what we're concerned with this, in this park. Gary, what's been the public reaction to this in the, uh, in the park? 
public reaction has been very good, particularly the public in the area. They're very aware and very concerned of the fire problems up here. They're concerned about this park, the number of people that use it in the summer, and the fact that uh, that usage increases the fire incidence up here. They're concerned that a fire will start in the park and, and move off onto the private land. So we've had very, very good reception from the local uh, people. How about visitors? The visitors, at first, are concerned about will it get away, what damage might it do, is it hurting the wildlife, is it hurting the birds, and just a little bit of looking at what's going on and talking with them uh, seems to alleviate the problem. We had a group came in yesterday of, uh, they look like about second graders, and the leader came over to the entrance and one of the girls was just clutching onto her, just, just wouldn't let go at all. And she said, the little girl wondered, is this, is this fire something you're doing on purpose or is, is that wildfire? And we explained what it was and she said, oh, that's fine then. She just didn't want to stay here if it was a wildfire. And they were, you know, that, that answered her, her question. But people are just naturally afraid of fire and they see the fire, they see the smoke, and it, it brings up questions, it brings up fears, but uh, just a short explanation seems to handle it. We've really not had any problem with the public and as I say, particularly the people that live up here, just, just happy. Uh, almost all the surrounding landowners up here said, well, can you come on over and do my land too, you know, while you're at it. So it's, uh, no, it isn't the problem that it's sometimes made out to be. I won't, uh, I won't lose any sleep over burning. I, uh, I've had a lot of time watching a lot of people burn a lot of brush. And I think it's really kind of neat today to stand here and watch Dr. Bissell stand in the smoke. I think it's even a little neater that he calls other people to go out and stand in it with him. Uh, what I'd like to say, though, is I think this is a great tour. I really appreciate all the time and effort everybody put into it. Dr. Biswell is great. It's great to see him again standing in a fire. I'd really like to thank Gary Reese, Carl Baker, and the fellow that was out there with a drip pot. Where is he? Right down there. I forgot your name. Elgie. Elgie, you vet. That's a great job. I appreciate that. And Walt Gray is our farm advisor. I thought Walt was just wound up in clovers. But I'm really glad to find out the misses around a little bit of smoke. The only thing is I'd like to get you up into Madera County. We're a little different in the foothills up there than this little burning fire. I'd like to get him up and show him a, a hot one. <laughs> and I'd like to thank all of you for being here today, especially, where is he? Mike Stroud. Boy, I'll tell you, he protects me all the time. And I'd like to give all these people a hand today. <laughs>